Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest written story on earth, part two. We continue with tablet six. We see that Ishtar, the goddess, wants to have a divine union with Gilgamesh, who is two thirds, or no, sorry, three quarters uh, god and one quarter man. Uh, she wants a divine union with him, but he has refused her. And she goes up to Anu to uh, complain about this. Anu addresses Princess Ishtar, saying, What is the matter? Was it not you who provoked King Gilgamesh? So Gilgamesh recounted despicable deeds about you, despicable deeds and curses. Ishtar spoke to her father, Anu, saying, Father, give me the bull of heaven, so he can kill Gilgamesh in his dwelling. If you do not give me the bull of heaven, I will knock down the gates of the netherworld, I will smash the doorposts and leave the doors flat down, and will let the dead go up to eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. Anu addressed Princess Ishtar, saying, If you demand the bull of heaven from me, there will be seven years of empty husks for the land of Uruk. Have you collected grain for the people? Have you made grasses grow for the animals? Ishtar addressed Anu, her father, saying, I have heaped grain in the granaries for the people. I have grasses grow. I made grasses grow for the animals in order that they may eat in the seven years of empty husks. I have collected grain for the people. I have made grasses grow for the animals. When Anu heard her words, he placed the nose rope of the bull of heaven in her hand. Ishtar led the bull of heaven down to the earth. When it reached Uruk, it climbed down to the Euphrates. At the snort of the bull of heaven, a huge pit opened up, and one hundred young men of Uruk fell in it. At a second snort, a huge pit opened up, and two hundred young men of Uruk fell in it. At his third snort, a huge pit opened up, and Enkidu fell in it up to his waist. Then Enkidu jumped out and seized the bull of heaven by its horns. The bull spewed his spittle in front of him. With this thick tail, with his thick tail, he flung his dung behind him. Enkidu addressed Gilgamesh, saying, My friend, we can be bold. How shall we respond, my friend I saw, and my strength? I will rip out. I and you, we must share. I shall grasp the bull. I will fill my hands in front. Between the nape, the horns, and thrust your sword. Enkidu stalked and hunted down the bull of heaven. He grasped it by the thick of its tail and held on to it with both his hands, while Gilgamesh, like an expert butcher, boldly and surely approached the bull of heaven between the nape, the horns, and he thrust his sword. After they had killed the bull of heaven, they ripped out its heart and presented it to Shamash. They withdrew, da bowing down humbly to Shamash. Then the brothers sat down together. Ishtar went up onto the top of the wall of Rook heaven, heaven, cast herself into the pose of mourning, and hurried her woeful curse. Woe unto Gilgamesh, who slandered me and killed the bull of heaven. When Enkidu heard this pronouncement of Ishtar, he wrenched off the bull's hind quarter and flung it at her face. If I could only get at you, I would do the same to you. I would drape his innards over your arms. Ishtar assembled the cultic women of lovely locks, joy girls, and harlots, and set them to mourning over the hind quarter of the bull. Gilgamesh summoned all the artisans and craftsmen. All the artisans admired the thickness of its horns, each fashioned from thirty minas of lapis lazuli. Two fingers thick is their casing. Six vats of oil, the contents of the two, he gave as ointment to his personal god Lugalbanda. He brought the horns in and hung them in the bedroom of the family head Lugalbanda. They washed their hands in the Euphrates and proceeded hand in hand, striding through the streets of Uruk. The men of Uruk gathered together, staring at them. Gilgamesh said to the palace retainers, Who is the bravest of the men? Who is the boldest of the males? 
Gilgamesh is the bravest of the men, the boldest of the males. She at whom we flung the hindquarter of the bull of heaven in anger, Ishtar, has no one that pleases her in the street. Gilgamesh held a celebration in his palace. The young men dozed off, sleeping on the couches of the night. Enkidu was sleeping and had a dream. He woke up and revealed his dream to his friend. Tablet 7 Tablet 7 My friend, why are the great gods in conference? In my dream, Anu, Enlil, and Shamash held a council, and Anu spoke to Enlil, because they killed the bull of heaven and have also slain Hambaba. The one of them who pulled up the cedar of the mountain must die. Enlil said, Let Enkidu die, but Gilgamesh must not die. But the son of God, sun meaning the uh, planet, the solar disk, but the son Bur, Bur, the son of God of heaven, replied to Valiant and Lil, Was it not at my command that they kill the bull of heaven and Hambaba? Should now innocent Enkidu die? Then Enlil became angry at Shamash, saying, It is you who are responsible because you travel daily with them as their friend. Enkidu was lying sick in front of Gilgamesh. His tears flowed like canals. He, Gilgamesh, said, O brother, dear brother, why are you absolving me instead of my brother? Then Enkidu said, So now must I become a ghost, to sit with the ghosts of the dead, to see my dear brother nevermore. In the cedar forest where the great gods dwell, I did not kill the cedar. Enkidu addressed Gilgamesh, saying to Gilgamesh, his friend, Come, friend, the door. Enkidu raised his eyes, and spoke to the door as if it were human. You stupid wooden door, with no ability to understand. Already, at ten leagues, I selected the wood for you, until I saw the towering cedar. Your wood was without compare in my eyes. Seventy-two cubits was your height, fourteen cubits your width, one cubit your thickness. Your doorpost, pivot stone, and capstone, a post cap, I fashioned you and I carried you to Nippur. Had I known, O door, that this would be your gratitude, and this your gratitude, I would have taken an axe and chopped you up, and lashed your planks into, and it's, I erected thee, and in Uruk they heard. But yet, O door, I fashioned you and I carried you to Nippur. May a king who comes after me reject you. May the god... May he remove my name and set his own name there. He ripped out, threw down. He, Gilgamesh, kept listening to his words and retorted quickly. Gilgamesh listened to the words of Enkidu, his friend, and his tears flowed, flowed and Gilgamesh addressed Enkidu, raying, Friends, the gods have given you a mind broad, and though it behooves you to be sensible, you keep uttering improper things. Why, my friend, does your mind utter improper things? The dream is important but very frightening. Your lips are buzzing like flies. Though there is much fear, my dream is very important. To the living, they, the gods, leave sorrow. To the living, the dream leaves pain. I will pray and beseech the great gods. I will seek and appeal to your god. Enlil, the father of gods. Enlil, the counselor. You... I will fashion a statue of you, of God without measure, of gold without measure. Do not worry, gold. What Enlil says is not. What he has said cannot go back, cannot. What he has laid down cannot go back, cannot. My friend, of fate goes to mankind. Just as dawn began to glow, Enkidu raised his head and cried out to Shamash. At the first gleam of the sun, his tears poured forth. I appeal to you, O Shamash, on behalf of my precious life, because of that notorious trapper who did not let me attain the same as my friend. May the trapper not get enough to feed himself. May his profit be slashed and his wages decrease. May be his share before you. May he not enter 
but go out of it like vapor. After he had cursed the trapper to his satisfaction, his heart prompted him to curse the harlot. Come now, harlot, I am going to decree your fate, a fate that will never come to an end for eternity. I will curse you with a great curse. May my curses overwhelm you suddenly in an instant. May you not be able to make a household and not be able to love a child of your own. May you not dwell in thee of girls. My dregs of beer stain your beautiful lap. May a drunk soil your festive festal robe with vot, vomit, the beautiful of the potter. May you never acquire anything of bright alabaster. May the judge, may shining silver, man's delight not be cast into your house. May a gateway be where you rake your pleasure. May a crossroad be your home. May a wasteland be your sleeping place. May the shadow of the city wall be your place to stand. May the thorns and briars skin your feet. May both the drunk and the dry slap you on the cheek in your city streets. May owls nest in the cracks of your walls. May no parties take place present. And your filthy lap may be his because of me while I blameless you have against me. When Shamash heard what his mouth had uttered, he suddenly called out to, to him from the sky, Enkidu, why are you cursing the harlot Shamhat? She who fed you bread fit for a god, she who gave you wine fit for a king, she who dressed you in grand garments, and she who allowed you to make beautiful Gilgamesh your comrade. Now Gilgamesh is your beloved brother and friend. He will have you lie on a grand couch, will have you lie on a couch of honor. He will seat you in the seat of ease, the seat at his left, so that the princesses of the world kiss your feet. He will have the people of Uruk go into mourning and moaning over you, will fill the happy people with woe over you, and after you he will let his body bear a filthy mat of hair and will don the skin of a lion and roam the wilderness. As soon as Enkidu heard the words of the valiant Shamash, his agitated heart grew calm, his anger abated. Enkidu spoke to the harlot, saying, Come, Shahat, I will declare your fate for you. Let my mouth, which has cursed you, now turn to bless you. May governors and nobles love you. May he who is one league away bite his lip in anticipation of you. May he who is two leagues away shake out his locks in preparation. May the, show, may the soldier not refuse you, but undo his buckle for you. May he give you rock crystal, lapis lazuli, and gold. May his gift to you bear earnings of filigree. May his supplies be heaped up. May he bring you into the of the gods. May the wife, the mother of seven children, be abandoned because of you. Enkidu's innards are churning, lying here so alone. He spoke everything he felt, saying to his friend, Listen, my friend, to the dream that I had last night. The heavens cried out, and the earth replied, and I was standing between them. There appeared a man of dark visage. His face resembled the Anzu. His hands were the pawns of a lion his nails the talons of an eagle. He seized me by my hair and overpowered me. I struck him a blow, but he skipped about like a jump rope, and then he struck me and capsized me like a raft. He trampled on me like a wild bull. He encircled my whole body in a clamp. Help me, my friend, I cried. But you did not rescue me, you were afraid and did not. Then he and turned me into a dove so that my arms were feathered like a bird. Seized me, seizing me, he led me down to the house of darkness, the dwelling of Irkala, to the house where those who enter do not come out, along the road of no return, to the house where those who dwell do without light, where dirt is their drink, their food is of clay, where like a bird they wear garments of feathers. The light cannot be seen, they dwell in the dark and upon the door and bolt there lies dust. On entering the house of dust, everywhere I looked there where royal crowns 
gathered in heaps. Everywhere I listened, it was the bearer of crowns, who in the past had ruled the land, but who now served Anu and Enlil, cooked meats, served confections, and poured cool water from water skins. In the house of dust that I entered, there sat the high priest and acolyte. There sat the purification pest and ascetic, ecstatic. There sat the anointed priest of the great gods. There sat Etana. There sat Sumukan. There sat Eresh Kigao, the queen of the netherworld. Belet Seri, the scribe of the netherworld, knelt before her. She was holding the tablet and was reading it out to her at Eshkigal. She raised her head when she saw me. Who has taken this man? Fifty lines are missing here. I, who went through every difficulty, remember me and forget not all that I went through with you. My friend has had a dream that bodes ill. The day he had the dream came to an end. Enkidu lies down a first day, a second day, that Enkidu in his bed, the third day, the fourth day, that Enkidu in his bed, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, that Enkidu in his bed, the eighth, the ninth, that Enkidu in his bed, the tenth. Enkidu's illness grew even worse. Enkidu drew up from his bed and called out to Gilgamesh. My friend hates me while he talks talked to me in Iruk. As I was afraid of the battle, he encouraged me. My friend who saved me in battle has now abandoned me. I and you. Twenty lines are missing here. At his noises, Gilgamesh was roused. Like a dove, he moaned. May he not be held in death. O preeminent among men, to his friend, I will mourn him at his side. Tablet 8 continues. Tablet 8. Just as day began to dawn, Gilgamesh addressed his friends, saying, Enkidu, your mother, the gazelle, and your father, the wild donkey, engendered you. Four wild asses raised you on their milk, and the herds taught you all the grazing lands. May the roads of Enkidu to the cedar forest mourn you, and not fall silent night or day. May the elders of the broad city of Uruk Haven mourn you. May the peoples who gave their blessing after us mourn you. May the men of the mountains and hills mourn you. May the pastures, lands shriek in mourning as if it were your mother. May the, the cypress and the cedar which we destroyed in our anger mourn you. May the bear, hyena, panther, tiger, water buffalo, jackal, lion, wild bull, stag, ibex, all the creatures of the plains mourn you. May the holy river Ulaja, among those banks we grandly used to stroll, mourn you. May the pure Euphrates, to which we would libate water from our water skins, mourn you. May the men of Uruk Haven, whom we saw in our battle when we killed the bull of heaven, mourn you. May the farmer, who extols your name in his sweet work song, mourn you. May the of the broad city who exalted your name mourn you. May the herder who prepared butter and light beer for your mouth mourn you. May who put ointments on your back mourn you. May who prepared fine beer for your mouth mourn you. May the harlot you rubbed yourself with oil and felt good mourn you. May of the wife placed a ring on you mourn you. May the brothers go into mourning over you like sisters. The lamentations, lamentation priests, may their hair be shorn off on your behalf. Enkidu, your mother and your father are in the wastelands, and I mourn you. Hear me, O elders of Uruk, hear me, O men. I mourn for Enkidu, my friend. I shriek in anger, anguish like a mourner. You, axe at my side, so trusty at my hand. You, sword at my waist. Shield in front of me, you my festal garment, a sash over my loins. The evil demon, an evil demon, appeared and took him away from me. My friend, the swift mule, fleet wild ass of the mountain, panther of the wilderness. 
Enkidu, my dear friend, the swift mule, fleet wild ass of the mountain panther of the wilderness, after we joined together and went up into the mountain, fought the bull of heaven and killed it, and overwhelmed Humbaba, who lived in the cedar forest. Now what is this sleep which has seized you? You have turned dark and do not hear me, but his, Enkidu's eyes, do not move. He touched his heart, but it beat no longer. He covered his friend's face like a bird, swooping down over him like an eagle, and like a lioness deprived of her cubs, he kept pacing to and fro. He shears off his curls and heaps them onto the ground, ripping off his finery and casting it away as an abomination, just as day began to dawn. Gilgamesh and issued a call to the land. You, blacksmith, you, lapidary, you coppersmith, you goldsmith, you jeweler. Create my friend, fashion a statue of him. He fashioned a statue of his friend, his features. Your chest will be of lapis lazuli. Your skin will be of gold. Ten lines are missing here. I had you recline on the great couch. Indeed, on the couch of honor I let you recline. I had you sit on the position of ease, the seat of the left, so that princes of the world kissed your feet. I had the people of Uruk mourn and moan for you. I filled happy people with woe over you, and after you died, I let a filthy mat of hair grow over my body, and donned the skin of a lion and roamed with the wilderness. Just as day began to dawn, he undid his straps. I, Carnelian, 85 lines are missing here. To my friend, your dagger to Bibi. 40 lines are missing here. The judge of the Anunnaki, when Gil Gilgamesh heard this, the Zikru of the river he created, just as day began to draw, Gilgamesh opened and brought out a big table of Sisu wood, the carnelian bowl he filled with honey, the lapis lazuli bowl he filled with butter, he provided and displayed it before Shamash. All of the last column, some 40 to 50 lines, is missing. We go now to Tablet 9. Tablet 9. Over his friend, Enkidu, Gilgamesh cried bitterly, roaming the wilderness, saying, I'm going to die. I am not like Enkidu. Deep sadness penetrates my core. I fear death and now roam the wilderness. I will set out to the reign of Utanapishtim, son of Ubartutu, and will go with utmost dispatch. When I arrived at mountain passes at nightfall, I saw lions. I was terrified. I raised my head in prayer to Sin, S-I-N, to the great lady of the gods, my supplication poured forth. Save me for, from I. He was sleeping in the night, but awoke with a start with a dream. A warrior enjoined his life. He raised his axe in his hand, drew the dagger from his sheath, and fell into their midst like an arrow. He struck and he scattered them. A name of the former, a name of the second. Twenty-six lines are missing here, telling of the beginning of his quest. The scorpion beings, the mountain is called Mashu. Then he reached Mount Mashu, which daily guards the rising and setting of the sun, above which only the dome of the heavens reaches, and whose flanks reaches as far as the netherworld below. There were scorpion beings watching over its gate. Trembling terror they inspire, inspire the sight of them is death. Their frightening aura sweeps over the mountains. At the rising and setting, they watch over the sun. When Gilgamesh saw them, trembling terror blanketed its face, but he pulled himself together and drew near to them. The scorpion being called out to his female, he who comes to us, his body, is the flesh of gods. The scorpion being, his female, answered him, Only two-thirds of him is a god, one-third is a man. The male scorpion being called out, saying to the offspring of the gods, 
Why have you traveled so distant a journey? Why have you come here to me, over rivers whose crossing is treacherous? I want to learn your, I want to learn. Sixteen lines are missing. When the text resumes, Gilgamesh is speaking. I have come on account of my ancestor Utana Pishtin, who joined the assembly of the gods and was given eternal life. About death and life I must ask him. The scorpion being spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Never has there been, Gilgamesh, a mortal man who could do that. No one has crossed through the mountains. For twelve leagues it is darkness throughout. Dense is the darkness, and light there is none. To the rising of the sun, to the rising of the sun, to the rising of the sun, they caused to go out. Sixty-seven lines are missing, in which Gilgamesh convinces the scorpion being to allow him passage. Though it be in deep sadness and pain, in cold or heat, gasping after breath, I will go on. Now open the gate. The scorpion being spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Go on, Gilgamesh, fear not. The Mashu mountains I give to you freely. The mountains, the ranges you may traverse. In safety may your feet carry you. The gate of the mountain, to the rising of the sun, to the rising, to the setting of the sun, to the setting of the sun, they caused to go out. Sixty-seven lines are missing in which Gilgamesh convinces the scorpion being to allow him passage, as we said. Though it be in deep sadness and pain, in cold or heat, grasping or death, I will go on. Now open the gate. The scorpion being spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Go on, Gilgamesh, fear not. The Mashu Mountains I give you freely to traverse. Along the road of the sun he journeyed, one league he traveled. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither that lies ahead or behind does it allow him to see. Two leagues he traveled. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Twenty-two lines are missing. Four leagues he traveled, dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Five leagues he traveled, the same happens. Six, seven leagues, eight leagues he traveled and cried out. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead or behind does it allow him to see. Nine leagues he traveled, the north wind. It licked at his face. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Ten leagues he traveled is near. Four leagues, eleven leagues, he traveled and came out before the sunrise. Twelve leagues he traveled and it grew brilliant. It bears lapis lazuli as foliage, bearing fruit a delight to look upon. Twenty-five lines are missing here describing the garden in detail. Cedar agate of the sea, lapis lazuli like thorns and briars, chameleon, rubies, hematite, el emeralds of the sea, Gilgamesh on walking onwards, raised his eyes and saw. We go to tablet 10. The tavern keeper, Siduri, who lives by the seashore, she lives. The pot stand was made for her, the golden fermenting vat was made for her. She is covered with a veil. Gilgamesh was roving about, wearing a skin, having the flesh of the gods in his body, but sat and deep within him, looking like one who has been traveling a long distance. The tavern keeper was gazing off into the distance. Puzzled to herself, she said, wondering to herself, What fellow is surely, that fellow is surely a murderer. Where is he heading? As soon as the tavern keeper saw him, she bolted her door, bolted her gate, bolted the lock. But at her noise, Gilgamesh pricked up his ears, lifted his chin to look about, and then laid his eyes on her. Gilgamesh spoke to the tavern keeper, saying, Tavern keeper, what have you seen that made you bolt your door? Bolt your gate, bolt your lock. If you do not let me in, I will break your door and smash the lock. The wilderness, Gilgamesh, 
The tavern keeper, Siduri, who lives by the seashore, she lives. The pot stand was made for her. The golden fermenting vat was made for her. She is covered with a veil. Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh was roving about, wearing a skin, having the flesh of the gods in his body, but saddened deep within him, looking like one who has been traveling a lot, long distance. The, tra the tavern keeper was gazing off into the distance, puzzled to herself and said, wondering to herself, that fellow is surely a murderer. Where is he heading? Gilgamesh then said to the tavern keeper, I am Gilgamesh. I killed the guardian. I destroyed Humbaba who lived in the cedar forest. I slew lions in the mountain passes. I grappled with the bull that came down from heaven and killed him. The tavern keeper spoke to Gilgamesh saying, if you are Gilgamesh, who killed the guardian? Who destroyed Humbaba who lived in the cedar forest? Who slew lions in the mountain passes? Who grappled with the bull that came down from heaven and killed him? Why are your cheeks emaciated, your expression desolate? Why is your heart so wretched, your features so haggard? Why is there such sadness deep within you? Why do you look like one who has been traveling a long distance? So that ice and heat have seared your face. You roam the wilderness. Gilgamesh spoke to her and the, to the tavern keeper and said, Tavern keeper, should not my cheeks be emaciated? Should my heart not be wretched? My features not haggard? Should there not be sadness deep within me? Should I not look like one who has been traveling a long distance and should ice and heat not have seared my face? Should I not roam the wilderness? My friend, the wild ass who chased the wild donkey panther of the wilderness, Enkidu, the wild ass who chased the wild donkey panther of the wilderness, we joined together and went up into the mountain. We grappled with and killed the bull of heaven. We destroyed Humbaba who lived in the cedar forest. We slew lions in the mountain passes. My friend who I love deeply, who went through every hardship with me, Enkidu, whom I love deeply, who went through every hardship with me, the fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I mourned over him and would not allow him to be buried until a maggot fell out of his nose. I was terrified by his appearance. I began to fear death and so roam the wilderness. The issue of my friend oppresses me, so I have been roaming long trails through the wilderness. The issue of Enkidu, my friend, oppresses me, so I've been roaming long roads through the wilderness. How can I stay silent? How can I be still? My friend who I love has turned to clay. Am I not like him? Will I lie down never to get up again? Gilgamesh spoke to the tavern keeper saying, so now tavern keeper, what is the way to Unantapishtim? What are its makers Give me them, give them to me, give me the makers, the markers, give me the markers. If possible, I will cross the sea. If not, I will roam through the desert, the wilderness. The tavern keeper spoke to Gilgamesh saying, There has never been, Gilgamesh, any passage whatever. There has never been anyone since days of yore who crossed the sea. The only one who crosses the sea is valiant Shamash, except for whom for him who can cross. The crossing is difficult, its ways are treacherous, and in between there are waters of death that bar its approaches. And even if Gilgamesh you should cross the sea, when you reach the waters of death, what would you do? Gilgamesh over there is Urshanabi, the ferryman of Utanapishtim. The stone things are with him, he is in the woods picking mint. Go on, let him see your face, if possible, cross with him. If not, you should turn back. When Gilgamesh heard this, he raised his axe in his hand, drew the dagger from his belt, and slipped stealthily away after them. Like an arrow, he fell among them, the stone things. From the middle of the woods, their noise could be heard. Urshanabi, the sharp-eyed, saw. 
When he heard the axe, he ran towards it. He struck his head. Gilgamesh, he clapped his hands and his chest, while the stone things, the boat, water of death, broad sea, in the waters of death, to the river, to the boat, on the shore, Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi, the ferryman. Urshanabi spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, why are your cheeks emaciated, your expression desolate? Why is your heart so wretched, your features so haggard? Why is there such sadness deep within your soul? Why do you look like one who has been traveling a long distance, so that ice and heat have sheared your face? Why, you roam the wilderness? Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi, saying, Urshanabi, should not my cheeks be emaciated, my expression desolate? Should my heart not be wretched, my features not haggard? Should there not be sadness deep within me? Should I not look like one who traveled a long distance? And should ice and heat have not have sheared my face? Should I not roam the wilderness? My friend who chased wild asses in the mountain, the panther of the wilderness. Enkidu, my friend who chased wild asses in the mountain, the panther of the wilderness. He joined, we joined together, we went up to the mountain, we grappled with and killed the bull of heaven we destroyed humbaba who dwelled in the cedar forest who slew lions in the mountain passes my friend who i love deeply who went through every hardship with me enkidu my friend who i love deeply who went through every hardship with me the fate of mankind has overtaken him six days and seven nights i mourned over him and would not allow him to be buried until a maggot fell out of his nose I was terrified by his appearance. I began to fear death and so roam the wilderness to issue of my friend. The issue of my friend oppresses me. So I've been roaming long trails through the wilderness. The issue of Enkidu, my friend, oppresses me. How can I stay silent? How can I still be still? My friend whom I love has turned to clay. Enkidu, my friend whom I love, has turned to clay. Am I not like him? Will I lie down, never to get up again? Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi, saying, Now, Urshanabi, what is the way to Utanapishtim? What are its markers? Give them to me, give me the markers. If possible, I will cross the sea. If not, I will roam the wilderness. Urshanabi spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, It is your hands, Gilgamesh, that prevent the crossing. You have smashed the stone things. You have pulled out their retaining ropes. The stone things have been smashed, the retaining ropes pulled out. Gilgamesh, take the axe in your hand, go down into the woods, cut down 300 punting poles, each 60 cubits in length. Strip them, attach caps, and bring them to the boat. When Gilgamesh heard this, he took up the axe in his hand, drew the dagger from his belt, and went down into the woods and cut 300 punting poles, each 60 cubits in length. He stripped them and attached caps and brought them to the boat. Gilgamesh and Arshunabi boarded the boat. Gilgamesh launched the Magilu boat and they sailed away. By the third day, they traveled a stretch of a month and a half and Ushanabi arrived at the waters of death. Ushanabi said to Gilgamesh, Hold back, Gilgamesh. Take a punting pole. Put your hand must not pass, but your hand must not pass over the waters of death. Take a second, Gilgamesh, a third, a fourth pole. Take a fifth, Gilgamesh, a sixth, a seventh pole. Make an eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, Gilgamesh, a twelfth. In twice sixty rods, Gilgamesh had used up the putting rods, the putting poles. Then he loosened his waist cloth, for Gilgamesh stripped of his garment and held it up on the mast with his arms. Utaman Utanapishtim was gazing off into the distance. Puzzled to himself, he said, wondering to himself, why are the stone things of the boat smashing to pe smashed to pieces? And why is someone not its master sailing on it? The one who is coming is not a man of mine. I keep looking, but not. I keep looking, but not. Lines are missing here. Utanapishtim said to Gilgamesh, why are your cheeks emaciated, your expression desolate? Why is your heart so wretched, your features so haggard? Why is there such sadness deep within you? Why do you look like one who has been traveling a long distance so that ice and heat have sheared, seared your face? 
you roam in the wilderness. Gilgamesh spoke to Utanapishtim, saying, Should my cheeks not be emaciated, my expression desolate? Should my heart not be wretched? Well, we're not going to go through the same thing. He, he talks about how he lost Enkidu um, and how he killed the um, uh, bull of heaven. Uh, Gilgamesh spoke to Utanapishtim, saying, That is why I must go on to see Utanapishtim, whom they call the far away. I went circling through all the mountains. I traversed treacherous mountains across the, all the seas. That is why sweet sleep has not mellowed my face. Through sleepless strivings I am strained. My muscles are filled with pain. I had not yet reached the tavern keeper's area before my clothing gave out. I killed bear, hyena, lion, panther, tiger, stag, red stag, and beasts of the wilderness. I ate their meat and wrapped their skins around me. The gate of Greek grief must be bolted shut, sealed with pitch and bitumen. As for me, dancing, for me, unfortunate, will rot, root out. Utanapishtim spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, While Gil Gilgamesh, do you have sadness? You who were created from the flesh of gods and mankind who made like your father and mother, have you ever, Gilgamesh, to the fool, they placed a chair in the assembly, but to the fool they gave beer dregs instead of butter, bran and cheap flour, which like cloths with a loincloth, and in place of a sash, because he does not have, does not have words of counsel, take care about it, Gilgamesh. The gods are sleepless, they are troubled, restless. Long ago it has been established, you trouble yourself, your help. If Gilgamesh, the temple of the gods, the temple of the holy gods, the gods, mankind, they took for his fate, you have toiled without cease, and what have you got? Through toil you wear yourself out, you fill your body with grief. Your long lifetime you are bringing near to the premature end. Mankind, whose offshoot is snapped off like a reed in a cane break, the fine youth and lovely girl and death. No one can see death, no one can see the face of death, no one can hear the voice of death, yet there is savage death that snaps off mankind. For how long do we build a household? For how long do we seal a document? For how long do we do brothers share the inheritance? For how long is there to be jealousy in the land? For how long has the river risen and brought the overflow waters, so that dragonflies drift down the river? The face that could gaze upon the face of the sun has never existed ever. How alike there the sleeping and the dead, the image of death cannot be depicted. Yes, you are a human being, a man. After Enlil had pronounced a blessing, the Anunnaki, the great gods, assembled. Ma Metum, she who forms destiny, determined destiny with them. They established death and life, but they did not make known the days of death. And now we go to the last tablet. That's tablet 11, the story of the flood. And uh, that will be part three and the last part of the Epic of Gilgamesh.